This summer, members of the Green Party of England and Wales will be voting to elect new members of the executive, commonly known as GPEX. Now, members of GPEX are elected to specific portfolios, and today I'm going to be joined by one of the candidates who is standing for the position of Publications Coordinator. Before I introduce them, though, I have one thing to ask of you, which is that you scroll down right now and hit subscribe. So without that out of the way and without further ado, I'll introduce the candidate that we have with us today. Now, you'll notice that this candidate is actually two human beings. That's because they are standing on a job share ticket. So I'll introduce them one by one. Firstly, we have Seb Cousins. Seb, how are you doing today? I'm doing quite fine. Uh, well, I'm very happy to be here. Amazing. And we also have with us Cade Hatton. Cade, how are you? I'm great. Uh, thanks for asking. Fantastic. So... We'll kick things off, hopefully, with the most straightforward question, which is why are you standing to be publications coordinator? I, I think um, part of the reason why we're standing is because we we really think that Green World and the rest of our publications can be a real force for good, um, both in the party and beyond. Um, but it needs to be managed in the right way. It needs to be promoted in the right way. Um, so we both have a lot of experience with social media. Um, Seb in particular is really amazing on the LGBTIQA plus greens uh, Twitter and making sure that we are getting everything out. We write articles as well, both um, as the committee and as the wider community. And Seb has done an incredible job really promoting articles that we've put out there. Um, so that's part of the reason that we want to run is to really freshen things up a little bit I think is is what we're thinking okay yeah so I would add on to what Kate has just said uh by saying that you know we have also have a massive set of elections next year we have locals uh the Grace London Assembly and Merrill uh included within that but there are its own specific sets of you know issues there and like you know so issues but like a specific set of causes to like support that also a general election next year and yeah you have to work with uh, not with not just with GPEX and my same budget and the election campaigns and helping other committee members where we can. Also like in helping um, send out helping send out and edit the sort of publications that we need to send out nationally, including our manifesto, like helping to write that with external companies on that. So you know massive important stuff is coming next year. Publications are the most serious year since 2019 for election. So that and we think we can do it. And I hope you at home watching this think you can do it as well. Fantastic. So uh, you mentioned in your uh, responses there about Green World. So for viewers who don't know, Green World is the party's official publication that um, used to be in print. It used to go out to all members. It's now online only. Uh, what I wanted to ask you to is um, how you would see yourselves as publications coordinator uh, improving Green World and its outputs. Um, well, so I, I personally have experience with regard to this kind of thing. I have a creative writing degree, which didn't just involve the writing side of things, but also things like um, copy editing and managerial editing, which is a, a big part of, of this role. Um, we'd really focus on things like a better social media presence. People don't often or at least people that I've spoken to don't often go out the way to actually look up Green World. Now it doesn't, you know, come through the letterbox. Um, so most people will will see what comes up on their social media feed um, and they'll read it that way. Um, so we'd like to, to kind of improve the way that we represent Green World on Twitter and on Facebook, because not only will that improve readership, but it'll bring more people in that are willing to write content for the, the magazine it will bring in people from more diverse backgrounds because right now it's it's a very while it is an internal sort of newsletter magazine um it's very inward looking so you're not maybe getting the people that are on the fringes of the party people who are from marginalized identities to really come in um and and really input into the way that it's both run and things that are written um i know seb has other ideas as well that are, are really exciting yeah, so uh, for instance, you know, I noticed this, uh, we have actually Bright Green as well. Um, you know, how you set up by your own press account, for instance. You know, it's all like looking out, I'm not just saying, but let's just join threads. 
I wouldn't say that's the uh, extent of our, you know, the peak of our, ra our radicalism on that uh, point. But like in terms of like, you know, looking at new social media outlook to like advertise on as well, I think it definitely help um, the influence of the world doing well. Um, as well, you know, reaching out to green celebs, for instance. Um, I'm not saying we'll get Cara Delevingne to write for Green World. Uh, what well, one can wish, though, and one can hope, uh, you know, uh, reach it, shoot for the stars and uh, set them on the moon, I suppose. But, you know, also looking out for like uh, green, uh, young green climate activists, uh, like uh, Michaela Lope, for instance, you know, articulate writer, um, mm -hmm. many other things. It would be great to have people like Michaela Lope or Michaela Lope herself to uh, write for Green World. Um, yeah, especially in time to engage that sort of young climate or it's not even young green, like from outside sort of like the green party itself, to like get people in joining uh you know, getting going in a bit like what Labour was to do, uh from my knowledge. So yeah, I'd say that's some of the some of what we want to do. We also want to like um ask people with like experience of, like managing like eco social or green or like um news outlets like uh, Bright Green, like you, Chris, <laughs> you know, asking how we can improve uh, the editorial standards um, of Green World and like, how we can make it, you know, I wouldn't say, you know, make it you know, the best that we can uh, achieve in that sense. So one of the, the conversations that's been happening around Green World in recent years is um, currently it's managed sort of externally by a uh, external organisation. It's essentially outsourced uh, in terms of the management of the publication. There's been a long conversation about whether that is the best way to produce the publication. And I wanted to ask you whether you thought that the current model works or whether you wanted to see Green World brought back in-house. I think it's it's definitely one of those things that we want to make sure that it is of a professional standard and a professional quality um, because you know we, we are a professional political party um, we want to make sure that it is up to a really high standard but I definitely think that we need more internal uh, influence I suppose we need to be able to to produce the things and for the green world magazine to produce the stuff that is really, really vital to what we're doing in the wider world. Um, I think it's one of those things, I don't think it's a, a black and white issue. I don't think it's a, we should only have it internally or we should just leave it external. I think it's something that there should be a lot of cooperation, a lot of joint work going on. Yeah, I mean, I don't think any of us here want uh, Green World to become Nevada. Uh, you know, in that sense, and just become like, um, you, know, the, you know, become the voice of DX or anything like that. That's absolutely not what we want. But it would be nice to see Green World, um, you know, you know, Green World like reflecting uh, sort of green values that the wider that the whole party has. You know, for instance, you know, working with and working with both on Green World as well to ensure that, you know. Uh, that we have a you know, high quality sort of output as well as representing not just you know, our policy, but like the values of the bit of those in our party to make them our party. Um, so that we definitely look like the yeah, actual policy there in terms of like you know, how we engage with it. And so Obviously, standing for publications coordinator, you're standing for that specific portfolio. But if you're elected, you'd be part of the wider GPEX team. And so I wanted to ask some questions, which I guess relate to stuff outside of that portfolio, but relate to the wider issues uh, that the executive are currently um, facing and dealing with. The first thing I wanted to ask you about is the issue of transphobia within the Green Party. Uh, so I think most members of the party would have struggled to have missed the fact that there's been, uh, for a number of years, an ongoing issue with transphobia within the party. And uh, what I want to put to all the GPEX candidates is how would you use your role as a member of GPEX to help tackle transphobia within the party? I think one of the, the very first things that we need to do, and I think this is something that that me and Seb have, um, we, we understand in a very deep way, like some of some of the other candidates similarly, but we are, I am currently one of the co-chairs of the LGBTIQA plus Greens, um, Seb was last year. Um, so we have a lot of experience in this. I've, I'm 
trans myself so it's something that I experience kind of on a daily basis sometimes within the party especially online um education I think is is one of the biggest things and making sure that both um within GPEX and in the wider party there is a real understanding of you know there are so many different things coming out you know the the results of different lawsuits and different uh, clarifications that are put out and things like that it helps to actually know what all of that means and get through the jargon that's something we try and do as, as the lgbti queer plus greens but it's something that we would have more of a platform for doing if we're on gpex i also think that we need to be less scared about calling something transphobic i think that's something that we have a real problem in in the party that we put being polite and being respectable over calling out discrimination and it's not just about transphobia either um you know there are problems within every political party around racism anti-semitism ableism um you know every other ism because people aren't perfect but I think one of the biggest things that we can do is educate. And then if someone isn't listening, we have got a, a complaints process that it, it has to be changed by the party. It can't be changed by GPEX. We can't dictate what happens. We can support what happens. We can support changes, but we, we can't demand them. And I think that's something that's really important to remember. While we are the exec, you know, while we would be the executive committee, while GPEX is kind of the, the top level, it's not you know the most important thing is gprc there are other bodies that deal with those things yes absolutely um i would add on to that you know and obviously we would um uh depending on who you know hope you know uh, would be in the coordinator uh whoever's elected obviously we would love to work with uh whoever or whoever gets you know elected to that role on like tackling not just trans but all these other issues within the party but I think we also need to like enjoy, and this is not a criticism of uh, the question itself, but we need to ensure that, you know, no one member or even one executive um, can single-handedly fix structural issues within the party. Um, at the end of the day, as it, as it said, every conference, conference is sovereign, um, you know, in that respect. And I, I, and I say this often enough when you, know, you, you see people on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, who say, why doesn't the Green Party leadership do more on transphobia? And well, the answer is they institutionally can't. Um, nor can GPEX really, in terms of like, you know, expelling all the transphobic members from the party. They can't do that. They, they do that. And you know, I think that's another debate in kind of if leadership should or they should or shouldn't be able to do that. Um, which I'm going to. But yeah, you know, I think we need to be careful in terms of like um, overstating, you know, how much power we would have uh, on the exec in terms of like, you know, uh, seriously rooting out of favor, which is what I think everyone, you know, in this room call wants. But you know, um, I, you know, we don't want to make any sort of like um, false promises and give people some false hope that you know, once you elect all the all in these phrases, there's still going to be a lot of work afterwards to get done. Uh, from every level of the party, and by heck, we will be committed to doing whatever we can to get things done on that period on that point. I would, if it if it's all right, I would like to come back on that slightly, which is um, you see it online, um, and you see it kind of both internally and externally with regards to the Green Party. Transphobia is is kind of the the headline thing that happens people talk about it all the time it's not the worst thing that happens in the party um it's not like the most insidious discrimination that happens within the party it's brought up every conference it's brought up between conferences every election it's brought up constantly and you know there are lawsuits going on about it but it's really not the worst thing that happens in the party it's not the thing that needs the most education on there there is widespread ableism as a disabled person myself um we've seen really clear signs of, of racist discrimination as well just looking at some of the way that members have been treated about how back in october uh ero came to conference and left straight away because he saw that the only other people of color were the staff of the venue we need to remember those things that that transphobia isn't 
the worst thing that's happening it's just the most publicized thing um and while you know the lgbtqa plus greens we are pretty good at calling out transphobia we need to be better as a party at calling out other things so that's another thing you know with whatever you know grouping or people that get elected to end coordinator we would want to work alongside them to ensure that they get represented as well that we make sure that all of these issues are publicized that we find ways to deal with those issues because you know we, we would be on gpac so that would be within our remit as a whole to help support those people um and i think that's really really important to make sure that we do um going forward people talk about how the lgbti qa issues get talked about so much well let's talk about the other ones too absolutely yeah and um yeah and i would also add you know in, in terms of, like publications and the world yeah we would love to see more like not just like trans and wider lgbti plus uh representation in terms of like people ask if they're public you know by right people are trans and who are wider lgbti plus but we also need to see more people of color right to the green world we want to see more disabled people back to the, 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 the green world we want to see more people from all these sort of like marginalized backgrounds and like marginalized experiences um yeah i think it's quite clear to say uh from like whenever i'm at conference and uh, this gets paid pretty much mention you, you don't see many people from the global south heritage uh, at a green party conference and that is absolutely disappointing and not not what we want to see from what should be you know our party should be like absolutely replacing labor in many areas and if we do not like you know represent community properly in terms of our membership how the hell are we going to represent um you know communities of color and of marginalized backgrounds and global south heritage if we don't have if we don't have the yeah you know, if we don't have members who are uh, who are that you know, background and don't have like uh and don't feel that they have those in the party that's wrong and categorically that's something that we need to address and part of that is going to be from like do they see writing uh you know right that is from the green party not doing like the green a green support perspective um yeah that's obviously not the only solution of the you know uh, of the you know, we're not asking you know it shouldn't people shouldn't just write us for the labor of like helping party but like it's certainly something that we need to work on uh as we turn away so the next thing I want to ask you about is another one of the sort of general responsibilities of GPEX. So <clears throat> for viewers watching may or may not be aware that GPEX is one of the two primary governing bodies of the party alongside the Green Party Regional Council, GPRC. And GPEX is responsible for, among other things, the financial well-being of the party and managing the party's finances. So I wanted to ask you, what's your experience of having uh, managed difficult, large, complex budgets and finances? Um, I personally don't have experience at a larger budget, but I have experience of my own. Um, and I know what it's like to have to make a small amount of money go a long way as a disabled person living on benefits. Um, so that's something that I think also we need to make sure that we're asking the right questions of the right people um, when it comes to deciding what our budget is, what we're going to budget for different things. Um, I've got a bit of experience from being on conferences committee at looking at just how much conference costs um, and trying to figure out ways of fundraising for that. Um, we need to remember that like we are a professional party and we need to make sure that we are engaging professionals when it comes to things like looking at a budget and making sure that we are making the right financial decisions. Um, also sort of with regard to i know it's something that comes up a lot when when we talk about trans issues and other lgbtqa plus issues um are the lawsuits and how everyone is terrified that there's going to be loads of lawsuits and loads of financial liability and I, I think we need to remember that um in a lot of cases we have a duty of care to everybody we have a duty of care to look after every member of the party uh, and we're actually endangering the party's finances by not dealing with these issues, by not looking at the root of them and, and dealing with the root of those issues. Um, so that's that's my 2P on, on the financial issues that we've got. Um, yeah, um, I would like to add as well. 
I've never had, I mean, you know, apart from being a student and obviously uh, being a low wage worker myself, you know, in terms of like formally organizing a budget uh, or helping to organize one, not the most, uh, not the most experienced apart from like, obviously reading over like uh, treasury reports and like from both YG, uh, from Young Greens and LCK Um, You know, I would like, I would stress that obviously I, I, I would also stress that, you know, I am sort of the sort of, sort of person who is like a hustler and went into this sort of thing. Um, you know, I can read like it. You know, I can read you know, a document and understand it you know, pretty quickly and to, you know, to get my bearings into it. And I think that's an important skill to have, especially when it comes to stuff like this. You, you know, um, I mean, I am the sort of person I will uh, add that, you know, uh, often gets like um, co-opted onto committees as a state pair of hands. Uh, be that young greens or else to try Facebook greens, uh, including a co-chair shit once. And you know, I I just get down uh, down with what I need to do and learn pretty quickly what needs to be done and you know, what uh, what else I can do within that. And if that includes learning how to budget correctly, um, <laughs> effectively, or helping to get a budget set correctly, then yeah, trust me, it's gonna happen. Uh, and it's going to have to be okay as well. So the last of my serious questions before I move on to my slightly less serious ones that I'd like to end these on is GPEX uh, in parallel with GPRC, the other body that I mentioned earlier, the Green Party Regional Council is um, has some oversight over the party's political strategy and its political ambitions. And uh, what I wanted to ask you is what do you think the Green Party needs to do right now to achieve its political strategy and ambitions? Sam, do you want to go first for this one? <laughs> uh, sorry, because you just have been questioning because I'm just nearly had a brain fade uh, in a Natalie Bennett. Totally fine, yeah. So I'm just asking uh, what you think the Green Party needs to do right now to achieve its political strategy and political ambitions. Um, so I would say to you, our ambition is, I mean, I believe our, our ambition is not to win the next general election. I, I believe that's a must be the PR, um, for a start. But our ambition is, you know, you know maybe, uh, one in a thousand better, hey. But, um, our ambition is, of course, to win a few more, it is to win, like, up to about three seats next general, next general election. Only Valley Brewery, Bristol Central, and right into the antique right and billion. Um, and also to like advocate for gold more councils across the country. Um, I think we can do that for sure. I think um how we can do that is by engaging more with communities that actually live in those areas that live in those areas, uh, that, that live in these virtual areas. So like you know, engaging with um so, for instance, um, something that I, something that me and Kate have been doing um, re, with LGBTQ plus greens, for instance, has been helping London, uh, helping with London in preparation for next year's um, BLA elections, uh, in trying to see what we can do to like, maximise the pink vote there, for instance. Uh, you know, the pink vote for those who don't know is like an academic term for like the LGBTQ plus vote. Um, you know, and seeing what we can do as a group to help them achieving that and you know so you know focusing on like getting those candidates who represent their community um you know through that the great community in London or the other five days and that um you know in trying to encourage like other guys to stand also like in trying to install their own sort of literature and social media content to go out uh, not just from us but also our London affiliate uh group but those but those candidates will get like um get highlighting spotlighted, you know, so that they engage with those communities because, you know, that's it, you know, that at the moment those communities, um, in our opinion, um, wrongly support the Labour Party, a, a party that has betrayed um, our community, and has betrayed many other communities, and that's why, you know, so we think that engaging with communities of, you know, these diverse marginalised communities is an absolutely crucial thing, and you know, obviously we've been focusing on LGBTQ okay, plus community um, because that's been our job as a liberation group. Um, but you know, we'd love to see, love to do this with like, um, love to see how we can help Greens of Colour, you know, if we love to help Greens of Colour help disabled Greens, you know, 
and so on and so forth in terms of like getting that vote out so you know helping local parties and liberation groups and like engaging with voters absolutely crucial uh but also like in like this is a positive example of green world uh for instance like they had a great article uh recently highlighting how Sheffield Greens helped get helped keep uh Sheffield City sanctuary for instance refugees recently that did pretty well in their Twitter I think as well so it'd be like um so like highlighting what local parties are doing gain that giving basically uh local parties digital content effectively as well that they can use in their own communications uh for social media and you know other, uh, other things like that and also give headlines to news maybe uh to advertise to their voters that's something that we can directly do publications but obviously we can also help in like general setting the electorate to, you know directly to elections and you know like those sort of like they say sort of like uh tactics that we have to do like in the we will not do the next general election next year also local as well yeah maybe I think an, another something that would be, I think, really, really helpful um, would be to to work on our relationship with Scottish Greens. Um, I think that was a, a huge but deserved blow um, to kind of a lot of people's opinion of us. The, the fact that the Scottish Greens kind of split away from us. Um, I think it's it's really vital that we work on building that relationship up again and, and and actually work on it as opposed to saying oh it'll be fine in a couple of years they'll fix it well no we need to start working on that right now i think that would make a huge difference to the way that we are seen on a, on a more international level as well um we know that the climate crisis can't be fixed by one country acting alone we need to work in a much more wide way we need to work in a global way um you know the the way that the Young Greens have been working, for example, with Scottish Greens, Irish Greens, um, I think it's really, really vital that we continue that work into the, the main wider party. Um, and I think that would actually really help us with our goals. I think that would help us both in the current elections and also in the wider kind of goal of um, a, a greener, liberated world. Um, so I think that would be a really, really major thing. Um, just fixing that relationship and, and in fixing that relationship we would be mending our relationship with the global greens who came very very close to, to severing ties with us as well last year so I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to do that uh, whether or not we get elected to GPEX but uh, fingers crossed we will be and we'll be able to get that work done ourselves. I mean yeah for sure I mean it was an absolute way I as one of the, as one of the co-chairs he's like having to like talk to global, you know, to various global greens from around like the world and also our, you know, our sisters in Scotland. It was stressful. Um and you know, in the case of Scotland, we didn't get the nice results, obviously. Uh there's that result of no ties, but as Kate said, something said to to an extent it was just like different by Scottish Greens. Um I can only hope that they they, 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 you know, they change their mind on that and we can all get back together and find social climate justice. Um, but, you know, um, we, we need to show that we made progress on our internal which is get a house in order and then we can make sure that the house that's on fire with the earth is like, you know, put out effectively and we can like, you know, have a better climate, uh, climate and social liberation for all. So uh, now time to move on to my slightly less serious questions. And to kick us off, I'm going to pick on Kay to go first. What is your favourite and least favourite Green Party policy? Um, I think my, my favourite, I'm going to be really predictable and say my favourite policy is trans women are women, trans men are men, and non-binary people exist and are valid. Um, my least favourite policy is the disability policy um because it is it's been a decade since the last main like even minor edits of the disability policy a full decade and it's been about 25 years since the actual whole thing was written and it hasn't had a major revision since then uh so yeah i'm going to be a bit boring and say say those two boring at all seb over to you 
Yeah, um, so my favourite policy, um, I, I'm going to be really banal and predictable here, uh, is net zero by 2030. Um, yeah, um, you, can't, you can't have social justice without climate justice, but you also can't have climate justice without social justice. Well, it's more of a good way around, I suppose, in this case. But, uh, you know, uh, you, it is, I think, it's a linchpin to everything, I feel, because it's not just about saving the climate, it's about making sure that we also have, like, yeah, a world to it, yeah, not just a world to live on, but also like opportunities for people to go into, which is a massive change in terms of material conditions, like people from like it, you know, people from the lower, you know, from the lower class background, and that's massively important. You know, um, yeah, I, I don't know if I would definitely call myself an eco socialist, but I'm definitely uh, someone who believes in ecology and in socialism. <laughs> um, and I think that sort of like massive social project to be with that zero is massively important. And you know, as a, and I guess if we all save the environment too, that would be quite nice. But <laughs> um, my least favourite, uh, I'm going to be slightly uh, give a slight give a cheat answer here, and it's actually um, our policy and electoral reform. Don't take that out of context. Uh, that's because while I do love PR, I, I, I love a certain type of PR more than the uh, full PR uh, system that's actually promoted by the party. I would love actually a combination system of the two round system using France elected elections with also a uh, half elected thing that um, with uh, FTV, um, which I don't think the party's ever going to vote for because it's a very technical, a very uh, geeky electoral nerd sort of thing to one. Um, you know, in all seriousness, uh, we do live in, um, we live in a system now where I looked at a um, poll recently, uh, which gave like 51% of the vote, and like it would give them 566 seats in Parliament. You know, what gives it's a terrible system, what we currently have. So, any electoral forms good, but I have a very new one, very picky version I want, and we're never going to get it in the past policy, uh, record policy statement. So, uh, I can dream on. <laughs> Not remotely surprised interviewing someone from the Green Party that they have strong views on the particularities of a particular electoral system. <laughs> um, so the uh, second of my less serious questions, and I'm starting with you this time, Seb, is what book has most influenced your politics? OK, what has most influenced my politics is actually a very, um, a very neat one, I would say. Uh, and that would be on the abolition of political parties by small day. Um, he was a French philosopher back in like the 1930s mostly. And he's basically talking about like how party politics to a large extent is totalitarian um, in the sense that part of it, you know, that a political party aims to totally, to totally have dominance over like both and members and you know, power over government structures. And yeah, that guy, and this was before I joined the Green Party. I read this and I was thinking, you know, wouldn't it be great if there was a political party that wasn't like this? Because I was thinking, yeah, this is something I usually up deep down and just like the little Lalo brought like the emotions from me, I feel as a well. Um, And then I found the Green Party, which has a very loose set of like, uh, 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 no whip system, for instance, uh, which is. Yeah, something that I do believe in, or something that give a damn about like constitutional politics. Um, yeah, and so I basically I, I love that book because I feel that I have managed to find a party that challenges uh, that sort of thesis. And yeah, I'm very proud that I managed to get one off in Snow Day, um, which I feel still a bit unfair to <laughs> some extent, but yeah. Brilliant, Kate. This is, it's, it's a weird, it's going to be a weird answer. So when I was a kid, I read a book called Red Sky in the Morning by Elizabeth Laird, which is, it's a young adult novel. It's about uh, a young girl who uh, her baby brother is born and is disabled. Um, and it is about kind of her life um, as a young, you know, as a teenager growing up with a disabled sibling. Um, and it really kind of, it spoke to me in a lot of ways. Uh, my mum is a social worker. Um, my dad was uh, a trading standards officer for a lot of, of his um, career. And 
it I was already quite right they're left wing <laughs> like not quite not quite sort of sort of veering towards Labour when I was younger um but then I kind of got more involved with with disability activism um you know I became disabled uh, physically when I was 19 20 and it it became a real sort of passionate point for me um and while you know labor has possibly a slightly slightly better policy when it comes to disability uh, than we currently do i think the the ideology of it the idea ideology of supporting people of looking after people in in the best way looking at policies like ubi um uh, universal basic income i need to get better at not using acronyms um and and kind of the the way that we look at um the way that we look at work, the way that we look at, at the way we care for people and support people um, really drew me to the Green Party kind of in general. Um, so, yeah, the, I think that book, it set me on reading, which set me on learning more and more and more until I found myself in the Green Party. Amazing. Uh, my penultimate question for you is who is your favourite historical figure? Cade, to go first. Um, <laughs> just, um i'm not sure um yeah i i i'm this is putting me on the spot <laughs> i don't know i'm not i'm not great with history it was my worst subject at school um i'm much better with uh, ask me who my actually no don't ask me who my favorite fictional character is because i'll give you 15 different names um i'd say Oh, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for you there. We'll, we'll go over to Seb and then we'll see if you've got one more. I mean, in, in contrast, I have a master's degree in history. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, uh, funnily enough, though, it's not actually from any period I'm actually studying in great detail, but it's actually Joan of Arc, I'd say, is my uh, go to historical figure. I think of. Um, you know, this gender non conforming uh, woman who like, stood off against the British um of france you know before like even like nationalism or patriotism good nationalism i should say uh <laughs> and uh patriotism even like exists with popular concepts in like european political thought she did it in france and like yeah how we treat her afterwards is like pretty yeah we burst at the stakes so not very well uh you know just a bit um but you know like how she led pretty much like the biggest comeback for france ever um, you yeah, know, more than their last Euros, um, last Euros campaign. And, <laughs> you know, they, they managed to, like, you know, she managed to, like, just take on the English, beat them, and, like, you know, led pretty much, like, the, you know, sort of, like, the peasantry in France, you know, again, like, this sort of, like, trade, well-trained in the army, and that sort of political leadership, and also the fact that she is, like, a queer icon in, like, uh, modern day, you know, from a... Um, uh, you know, from like those, uh, from like Transgender Warrior, for instance, um, to like the recent play I Joan. Um, so I was on at the Globe last year. Uh, I believe JK Rowling didn't like it that much. Uh, you know, um, to uh, what Beatrice Axel West wrote back in the 1920s in her biography. You know, she is like this iconic figure of what queer resistance can look like when it's like. About liberating everyone from like, in, you know, these imposing, oppressive, the life structures that come, that come out onto us. I don't know if that has any relevance to today's society at all. Right, have you got your historical I've, figure? Yeah, um, I, I, I'll probably say Alan Turing. Um, you know, as he's similarly, you know, he did well. <laughs> I say similarly, he did amazing things for England, but. You know, not quite, not quite amazing things for England, but in general. Um, but yeah, no, he did, he did some incredible things for England. He saved countless millions of lives potentially. Um, he was probably autistic, and as I am, and you know, he went through some some horrific, horrific things uh, at the end of his life, um, which we we as a party need to make sure never ever happens again um so yeah that I, I came up with something in the end 
And then my final question for both of you is who in the Green Party inspires you the most? And I'm going to pick on Seb to go first. Oh, that's harsh. There's so many. Um, inspires me in the Green Party. I would say... It's going to sound bad. Carla. I'd actually say Carla. Uh, Carla Denia, because... Um, I feel she take. I feel she is a great example of someone who has accidentally fell into politics. You know, started off as a uh, you know engineer for all renewables down in like uh, the south, the southwest, I believe. That's my place to listen to. <laughs> you know, and has you know risen to the top. Um, you know, it's all like um, you know, and has like, and now is like led. You know, obviously with a load of activists and like young green activists in particular with action days. You know. But with Carla as like the leader, effectively, and of course Adrian. But with Carla as the sort of like lead in terms of like um, you know these sort of election victories that we've had, you know, it's only I, I do look up to you know like you know two hundred and thirty Green councillors or something like that last night. Amazing, and I feel that she has sort of shown what I shown what a Green leader can do in terms of like um, like. You know, her interactions at conference, for instance, uh, you know, wanting to go and her intention to speak at conferences, conference and floor, I think is, I think that's pretty cool and admirable. Um, so I definitely say that, and I get on with Carla personally as well, and I do look up to her. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Carla from Seb, Kate, who's yours? Uh, Zach, I feel a little bit sorry for we've chosen the leadership team except for Adrian, but uh, but yeah, Zach, Zach Polanski is is um, he's just wonderful. Um, he's a really really caring person personally. Uh, remembers that I'm a massive D and D nerd, um, but he's he's also so passionate um, about the climate. He's so passionate about liberation, you know, for his communities and for every other community as well. You know, he doesn't just campaign, you know, he's a, a, a gay Jewish man of colour and he still campaigns on all of that. Plus, you know, women's rights, he uh, campaigns for trans people, campaigns for the GRT community. You know, he, he is just so passionate about uh, environmental and social liberation at such a grand scale. And he does an incredible job representing the party and representing every single diverse identity within it but uh, yeah um i look up to him very much i think we would be honest in saying that aging is definitely not top 10 though. you know yeah definitely de you know top 10 <laughs> yeah. high praise indeed well that's the end of my questions for you thank you so much for joining me today thank you thank, thank you for having us and uh, thank you for your questions so uh that was the fourth of my interviews with this year's candidates for the Green Party executive there are still more to come uh, the best way that you can make sure that you don't miss out on them is to hit the subscribe button while you're down there please do let us know what you thought about this interview in the comments and make sure you like and share the video too if you are able to please do head to bright-green.org forward slash donate and help fund these interviews and all the rest of the content that Bright Green puts out that's it from me today thank you all so much for watching and I will see you all very very soon